Greetings Church. I want to share with you today from uh, a passage of scripture that's really interesting uh, and short. Uh, I want to look at the shortest psalm with you. Uh, it's interesting that this is even in the Bible, that it's a self-contained, very short poem, a uh, song uh, that the people of God have sung for generations, Psalm 117. It's just two verses long, uh, four lines of poetry, plus a conclusion, and a concluding exclamation, if you will. It goes like this, Psalm 117, Praise Yahweh, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of Yahweh endures forever. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Now normally, uh, when you see Lord in your English Bible with all capital letters, like you see in Psalm 117 verse 1, it is the full uh, divine name. The name that the God of Israel revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 3 and then more fully in Exodus chapter 33. Uh, and how God revealed that name to Moses as his name forever that is to be remembered by all the generations of God's people. Normally, L-O-R-D, all capitalized in our English Bibles, is an indication that the Hebrew underneath is that divine name. But around 20 or 25 times, I forget the exact number off the top of my head, it's actually a shortened form, a nickname almost, or an abbreviated form. And our English Bibles don't make a distinction, but it is the form uh, Yah. It's missing the last two letters. Uh, Yahweh, the divine name, is uh, four Hebrew consonants. Uh, you may have heard of it referred to as the tetragrammaton, the four-letter word. Tetra means four. Uh, grammaton in Greek refers to a letter of the alphabet. And, and so a tetragrammaton is a four-letter word, a good one, not a bad one in this particular case. But the name of God is four consonants in Hebrew, and we usually pronounce it in English as Yahweh. But occasionally, only the first two consonants are, in, are printed in the text. And this comes across at the end of Psalm 117, verse 2, in the combination, praise Yah. Now, what's interesting about the ESV is that they spell it out like that, praise the Lord, with all capitals. But in some English Bibles, they give us the word hallelujah, hallelujah. That is just bringing over the Hebrew letters of this phrase. Hallelu is the command, praise. Hallelu means you praise in an imperative. And then the name is Yah. And then it's combined in a certain way in Hebrew that we could bring it over into English like we often do as Hallelujah. Uh, with the J-A-H at the end of hallelujah in English, representing this abbreviated divine name. So the idea is we are being commanded to give praise to the God of Israel whose name is Yahweh, or Yah, uh, in a shortened form here. And you see that most often in the later Psalms. Uh, it comes up in other places as well, in other poetic sections of Scripture a couple of times, but mostly in the Psalms, and mostly in the Psalms toward the end of the book of Psalms, um, including this one here, Psalm 117. So the call here from the psalmist, we don't know who wrote Psalm 117, we don't know when he wrote it, um, a, a, a person uh, among the people of Israel, but notice that he is commanding the Gentiles, all nations, to praise the God of Israel, Yahweh. That's the call, the call to worship, the call to praise, the call to speak well of the God of Israel. That's what praise is all about. In, in Hebrew especially, the idea of praise is a verbal idea. 
And it is in English, really, too, when you think of praising someone. We might praise someone for doing a good job on their homework. We might praise someone for some excellent achievement that they've gained. And we would do that by saying, good job, or saying something verbal to them to commend them for their uh, achievement or their work or their situation or whatever. The same thing is true in, in the Bible. Praise is all about what you say about God. And so the call is that all nations, not just the people of Israel, but all nations would come to praise, to speak well of, uh, to uh, commend the God of Israel whose name is Yahweh. Extol him, all peoples, all peoples. Uh, God deserves the praise and the extolling of all human beings on the face of the planet, right? He has done all things well, and he always does what is good. And so it is right and deserved that we would always speak well of God and draw attention to the good things that he's done in his, uh, in history, in his story, if you will. Extol him all peoples. Extol means to kind of uh, to speak well of, and again, to speak superlatively, to put him on the highest pedestal in the way that we talk about him, to talk about him in a way that is higher and better and greater than everything else that we would talk about. Extol him, all peoples. But then verse 2 gives reasons for this. See, the Bible doesn't just say, as a duty, you must praise God. He deserves all praise. It tells us why. He deserves all praise. It gives us tons of reasons pointing to not only the good things that he does and the good things he has done that, that uh, show us that he's worthy of all praise, but also because of his character. Certain attributes of God are highlighted here. So why should all nations, all peoples, praise and extol Yahweh, the God of Israel? Why? For great. Is his steadfast love toward us. Great is his steadfast love toward us. Now notice there's a distinction here. The us is not all people on the face of the planet. The us is God's people, the people who have a relationship with God. Now, for the, the person who wrote this was probably a, pe a, pers a Jewish person, a person who was a part of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, who related to God on the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. And so the us is the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. But you and I can now take this psalm and read it as Christians, people who relate to God on the basis of the New Covenant, who relate to God on the basis of our relationship to Jesus specifically. And so this steadfast love that's being spoken of is for us, not just the nation of Israel, not just the people of Israel, but all those who relate to God on the terms of the New Covenant who have this genuine relationship to God because Jesus has died to pay the penalty for our sins. You see, this steadfast love idea is very important in the scriptures. It's one of my favorite Hebrew words, and it's very important to understand what it means. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a Hebrew lesson here. The Hebrew word that is uh, translated steadfast love um, other Bible translations put it differently. Um, let's see, steadfast love. Uh, the King James Version, I think, says loving kindness very often. Sometimes the King James Version will use the word mercy to translate this word. Uh, but other versions will say loving kindness. Uh, uh, faithfulness is even used sometimes. But you see here in verse uh, 2, uh, the normal word for faithfulness is used in the next line. Uh, and so what is this steadfast love? What's the point? Well, the Hebrew, uh, it looks like this in Hebrew, more or less. Uh, let's see, my Hebrew drawing is a little bit rusty, so you'll forgive that. But, uh, and then uh, vowels are like these little dots underneath, like so. And so the way you pronounce that is chesed, chesed. Che, che. Gotta get that guttural in there. Chesed. Um, you could put it in English as uh, H E S E D. Um, and so it's from left to right. So chesed uh, is the um, 
the, uh, the way that you pronounce that word, chesed, and it gets translated uh, as uh, faith, uh, loyal, loyalty, or uh, loving kindness, steadfast love is the way that ESV put it, puts it. And the reason that it's steadfast is a part of the way that this word is, is, uh, is used is to emphasize the point of loyalty. That's the bottom line meaning of this term chesed. It's God's loyalty. You see, when we think about love in English or in America and in the West, we associate it more commonly with emotion and feelings. We speak of having affection for other people. And the Hebrew can speak of God having affection for his people, but he doesn't usually use this word. This word is kind of underneath and behind. The, the, as a motivator and a driver for why it is that God has affectionate love for his people. Why is that? Well, because beforehand, he has made a commitment to us. This is the idea of committed love. And so chesed has to do with loyalty fundamentally before anything else. Its root idea is loyalty, loyal love, the idea of a committed relationship between people that is bound in a loyal commitment. And so the beauty of this is the way this psalm and others speak of this. Great is his loyal love toward us. It's huge. It's massive. It's great. His loyalty is big and it's strong and it is everlasting. His loyalty will never run out. You see, he has committed himself to us. There's a beauty in that that just blows my mind because he has committed himself to people, human beings, who are lesser than him. They are not attractive to him. They are not equivalent to him. They're not a good match for him. And yet, he has committed himself. He has stepped down from his high position and he has come and reached out to people who are broken and sinful and rebellious even against him. And so his loyalty to us is always going to be stronger than our loyalty to him. Our commitment to God should be there, but we should admit and recognize the frailty of our commitment to God. But that should not threaten us or make us afraid or, or cause our relationship, to be, uh, our relationship with God to be in jeopardy. Uh, we shouldn't have fear or uncertainty or a lack of assurance in our relationship with God because of our own frailty and our own sinfulness. Because what guarantees our relationship with God, what guarantees it forever, is His commitment and His loyalty. And He has promised to be loyal to you. He is committed to all those who have come to know His Son. He is committed to all those who are in a relationship with him through his son, who have received Jesus, who know Jesus, and who follow Jesus. The psalm goes on in the second line of verse 2. Great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of Yahweh endures forever. So out of this chesed idea, out of this loyal love, there is this faithfulness to us, to a people. He is faithful to us, and his faithfulness endures forever. This reminds me of uh, 2 Timothy uh, 2, 12, I think it is, where if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You see, for him to break faith with us, for him to be to break his commitment to do us good forever would question his faithfulness. And he will never do that. And so I marvel at this little teeny tiny psalm, Psalm 117, the shortest of all the psalms, which calls on all people from all nations to praise the God of Israel because of his chesed and his faithfulness, which is his great strong, powerful, and unending, unyielding commitment to his people. And the reason that the nations should praise the God of Israel for that 
is because the nations can be caught up into that same relationship through the new covenant, the new covenant which provides a relationship with God through Jesus that goes beyond the boundaries of ethnicity and territory among the people of Israel. And so for all people on the planet, there's an opportunity to know the true God, the one true God who is full of this characteristic. I was really encouraged and built up in the series that we did on God as our shepherd, uh, and not, not mostly the ones that I did, but the one that Pastor Ken did on Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a favorite to many Christians, but it is a favorite to me as well. And, and Pastor Ken didn't take us to the end of the psalm, and that's fine. Uh, but at the end of the psalm, the end of Psalm 23, this characteristic, this chesed, gets brought into the picture. So I turn your attention to Psalm 23, verse 6, the end of the great shepherd psalm. David's confidence at the end uh, in his good shepherd, uh, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, being his shepherd, his confidence goes like this, Psalm 23, 6. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Now, what's interesting about this, the ESV is following the King James here, which translates chesed, in this case, as mercy. If you're reading the ESV, you can see a footnote that will tell you, or steadfast love, chesed. And so the idea is, so if we, if we keep the shepherding imagery throughout the psalm, what's going on here is, is God is describing here, David is poetically describing these attributes of God, goodness and chesed, loyal love, steadfast love, following him. The word is stronger, it's pursue, a chase down David all the days of his life. Now what's going on here? Well, if you keep your imagery in the shepherding imagery, it's like goodness and chesed, God's loyal love, are like God's sheepdogs. They're like God's sheepdogs that he uses to keep the sheep in the pen and on the right path. And they're constantly moving in and out of the flock, driving them to go in the right direction. His confidence, David's confidence, is that surely or only, the Hebrew word could be translated only, goodness and chesed, only goodness and loyal love shall follow me, shall chase me down all the days of my life. And if you think about David's life, that's a fascinating statement of faith. And if you think about your own life, can you make that statement? Can you recognize that even in the darkest valleys that you may have been through, even in the toughest times, maybe right now is one of those tough times for you as you sit at home in isolation, as you are, uh, maybe even some of you are still struggling to recover from COVID-19 and its effects. Can you look to this as your great confidence and know for certain that even when your body is breaking down, even when life is not going the way you would like it to, to go, only goodness, goodness from God and loyal love are surrounding you and nipping at your heels even in this moment. Can you see that with the eyes of faith? David's final line in Psalm 23 is helpful as well. His confidence is, and I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Now, if you think about David and his experience, you remember that the temple had not been built yet. They were still worshiping around a tent, a tabernacle that moved. And David's confidence here, when he speaks of the house of Yahweh, he's talking about that tent physically. So his confidence is, that word dwell is an idea of, I'm not with it right now, but I'm going to come home to it. That's where I want to go. That's like my home. I, wanna, I need to return there. I need to get back there and stay there. And so his confidence is that as the sheepdogs of, of God's goodness and God's faithfulness, his loyal love, his chesed, chase him down, he's going to make it back to dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. He's gonna stay in the presence of God forever and ever. Now, how do we read that as a Christian? Well, we've gotta recognize we don't have a tabernacle 
and we don't have a tent that we go to. We don't have a temple in an isolated spot that we go to. The scriptures tell us very clearly, repeatedly in the New Testament, that we as the church are the temple of God. We are the temple. We are the dwelling place. We are the house of Yahweh, the house of the Lord. And so when you read Old Testament passages that talk about the house of God or the house of the Lord, you need to think about those as a Christian in terms of the church. We are the temple, not the building, not that building up on the hill that we call Alfred Allman Bible Church, but the people, the community. So David's confidence there can be your confidence and my confidence as a Christian that we are to dwell in the house of Yahweh forever, meaning we are to dwell together as a body forever and ever. And all of that is rooted and grounded, not in our own ability to stick it out and to keep moving with each other, but in God's faithfulness to us, God's faithfulness to his own word and God's loyalty, his commitment to his people. He is committed to being with us and staying with us forever and ever and ever. And it's not just about that. It's about us staying together with him. It's not just about us as individuals. It's not just about me dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. It's about us together being the house of the Lord forever and ever. And so friends, even as we're isolated right now and we can't spend time together, we can experience the real community that is offered to us in words like this as we interact through technology. We are, our fellowship is not broken because of government imposition or because of sickness and illness. We are isolating from each other for good purpose and our fellowship is not broken. We can still experience unity, the bond of peace, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace together with each other as we communicate through the technology that we have. And as we share in being nourished from the same word, the same scriptures are, that are feeding me are feeding you, I hope. I hope you're feeding on God's word. I hope you're finding this to be true, that God's goodness and God's loyal love, his chesed, is strong. And I hope your confidence is that it will endure forever and it will carry you through these days. And it will buoy you, strengthen you, equip you to keep moving forward and to keep resting in the Lord and in all that he's provided. We can have hope because of God's loyalty, God's commitment to us, not because of my commitment to God. We are in this together, even though we're still apart. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your loyal love. We could not survive without it. We could not have hope without it. Thank you that you have chosen to commit yourself to sinners such as us. Thank you for your loyal love. Your commitment expressed most clearly and most beautifully in the gift of your Son who died for us, who purchased us, who's made a way possible for us to live with you forever and ever and ever. Thank you that we can dwell in your presence even now. We are not waiting for death, but we are waiting for your return. Father, we pray that you would hasten the day. I know that it is on the calendar. It is set. And nothing can change that date. You know it, and it will come in its time. Would you help us to wait well? Would you help us to trust you for the timing of all these things? But may our hearts be continually drawn to anticipating and looking forward to the return of our Savior to wrap up the history that has been full of pain and suffering and also full of your great grace both in our individual lives and on the grand scale of history. Thank you that you're in charge of it all. Thank you that you know the end from the beginning. Thank you that you've called us up into your great work. Would you help us to live faithfully in these days? Help us to follow our Good Shepherd and help us to revel and to worship and to praise our great God who loves us so much. I thank you for your love. 
In Jesus' name we pray.